Miguel Covarrubias was born in 1904 in Mexico City and at the age of 14 he left school and went to work for the Mexican Ministry of Public Education as an illustrator. But as is frequently the case I found no examples of this work. But in 1923 when he was 19 the well-regarded poet Jose Juan Tablada took it upon himself to persuade the Mexican government to award Covarrubias a grant which enabled him to leave for New York City with his portfolio of work in the hope of greater success. He spoke very little English but he was helped considerably by the community of more established Mexicans in the city including Tablada who was instrumental in convincing the photographer and artist Cheryl Schell to act as Covarrubias' agent. New York Times critic Carl Van Vechten introduced Covarrubias to many of his professional contacts and before long he was taking regular commissions from several of the most influential magazines including the New Yorker and Vanity Fair. Covarrubias was fascinated by the experiences and popular culture of black Americans and was frequently to be found in Harlem nightclubs creating many drawings and sketches for oil paintings based on his observations. And significantly in late 1924 Vanity Fair published eight of these drawings of Harlem nightlife, the first ever to appear in the magazine. In the same year he began to feature in full colour on the cover of Vanity Fair and these appearances raised his profile considerably. In 1925 his first collection of caricatures, The Prince of Wales and Other Famous Americans was published. A couple of these images were reproduced in full colour but most were exclusively monochrome, modernist and minimalist. A year later he illustrated the book Blues, an anthology of 53 songs, edited by the composer W.C. Handy. And this book provided Covarrubias with another opportunity to create a series of stylized tonal monochromes of black musicians. And in the same year he designed this striking cover for a book of poems by Langston Hughes. In 1927, a book with the then perfectly acceptable but now somewhat jarring title Negro Drawings was published, featuring another collection of half-tone monochrome illustrations of black New Yorkers. Around this time he met the dancer and choreographer Rosa Rolando and together they regularly made trips to Mexico, Europe, Africa and the Caribbean. Nevertheless, Covarrubias appears to have continued working as an illustrator, apparently unimpeded by his travels. And in addition to his ongoing work for the New Yorker, and particularly for the covers and pages of Vanity Fair, he also created a series of strikingly modern colour covers featuring yet more caricatures for the humour magazine Life in the later years of the decade. In 1929 he illustrated the book Born to Be, an autobiographical account of his early life written by the black singer Taylor Gordon, and as well as a brightly coloured frontispiece, Covarrubias produced another series of engrossing tonal monochromes. A year later he created yet more in this style for the book Frankie and Johnny, a story taken from the popular song of that title. This version was written by John Huston, who would later become one of America's greatest film directors. And Covarrubias' humorous decorative monochromes were a significant factor in the book's success. In 1930 he also began what would become a long-running series for Vanity Fair, collected under the generic title Impossible Interviews. These colour illustrations featured caricatures of pairs of well-known but unrelated personalities in a fictional and unlikely conversation. The images he created made for a frequently surreal series which necessitated equally improbable settings for the non-existent meeting to take place. The subtleties and juxtaposition of these images are largely wasted on most of us now, but viewed either as accomplished modernist caricatures or simply engaging editorial illustration, they've stood the test of time remarkably well. The examples shown here are from the earlier part of the series and I'll return to later examples further on. 
He and Rosa married in 1930 and they took an extended honeymoon trip to Bali where they became fascinated by the customs and culture of the island's population and he created many drawings of the island and its inhabitants while there. But in the meantime he carried on with yet more magazine work and also illustrated the book China by Marc Chardon published in France in 1931 with some radically simple but highly evocative pen and ink monochromes. In 1932, the Valentine Gallery in New York put on an exhibition of his paintings from the trip to Bali, and it generated a lot of interest and positive reviews from critics, and from that point onward he exhibited and sold his original works on a regular basis. In that year he also illustrated René Marin's novel Batuala, about French colonialism in Africa, with some breathtaking full-colour page illustrations, and among other examples of his jungle and rainforest painted work, these images clearly invoke the spirit of the French painter Henri Rousseau. His popularity in Vanity Fair showed no sign of fading, and he continued to create diverting and amusing colour covers and page illustrations, some of which were remarkably detailed and visually absorbing double page spreads of crowd scenes involving caricatures of a host of different well-known characters from both politics and show business. But in a less glamorous context in 1933, he created a series of cleanly executed calligraphic line drawings celebrating the revolutionaries of the Mexican Civil War for the book Peace by Revolution, written by Frank Tannenbaum. Covarubias felt compelled to return to Bali later that year to make more drawings and conduct research for a proposed book about the island. And while there, Rosa took photographs which would also be published in the finished project. His Impossible Interviews series for Vanity Fair had continued throughout this period, and if anything, they had become even more visually inventive than the earlier examples. However invested in his worthier projects Covarubius was by this time, he still obviously derived considerable pleasure from the production of these witty and highly attractive images, and didn't stop until the middle of the decade. In 1935 he illustrated the cover and a few simple black and white page decorations for the collection of short stories Mules and Men, written by Zora Neale Hurston and prolific as ever, in the same year he illustrated the book Tippy, a romance of the South Seas, written by Herman Melville. This was a significantly successful pairing of author and illustrator, despite the fact that Melville had created the original story about the Polynesian Marquesas Islands almost a century earlier. Cobarubius evoked this exotic location with considerable aesthetic and narrative prowess, and it rightly proved a popular edition. Although a work of fiction, the authority of Covarubius' evocations of tribal life gave the book considerable added credibility. In 1935, the couple returned to live in Mexico City, and it was while there that they completed the book Island of Bali. It was promoted extensively in Vanity Fair magazine, which garnered a lot of interest, and the book immediately achieved bestseller status. The island of Bali was 500 pages long, and although broadly popular in its appeal, it was a serious and well-regarded document about the lives and culture of the inhabitants of this distant location. Most of the images were monochrome, and many were fairly diagrammatic and functional, but there were also some vibrant colour illustrations dotted throughout, which were as decorative and aesthetically pleasing as they were fascinating and the book was reprinted many times in the coming decades. In the later 1930s, Covarubias also painted a few murals, such as this idyllic scene for the Ritz Hotel in Mexico City in 1937, and a particularly Rousseau-inspired jungle scene for the restaurant at the Camino Real Hotel in Polanco, although I couldn't tell you when it was painted. At this time he was also increasing his client base for magazine work, with covers for both Vogue and Fortune. In 1938 the Limited Editions Club published his illustrated edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1852. This series of expressive monochromes added considerably to the intense emotional appeal of this tale of slavery in the 19th century. In 
1939, Kol Varubius was commissioned by the Golden Gate International Exposition to create a series of six large decorated maps entitled Pageant of the Pacific to be displayed in San Francisco a year later. To complete this considerable commission, he needed to conscript fellow Mexican artist Antonio Ruiz, whose painted style was similar to Covarubius's. When they completed the work, the maps were exhibited with considerable popular success, and they were later shown at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. In 1941, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, the USA joined forces with the Allies but most of his magazine work in this period didn't concern itself with the conflict and remained quite frivolous. Nevertheless, there were a couple of exceptions to this, including a particularly vitriolic and unflattering double-page image of the enemy. In 1942, he illustrated an edition of The Discovery and Conquest of Mexico, a 16th century account by Bernal Diaz del Castillo, with some far from typical gesturally rendered images. Green Mansions, an exotic tale set in the South American rainforest, had originally been written by William H. Hudson in 1904. But in 1944, Covarubius was commissioned by the Heritage Press to create an illustrated edition. And although his illustrations generally avoided the human dimensions of the story, his skill at rendering jungle and rainforest scenery was well to the fore in the compelling images he produced. In the early 1940s, he travelled many times to the Isthmus of Tuantepec to collect material for his book Mexico South, which was eventually published in 1946. Such was his reputation as an ethnologist and scholar at this time that he was offered a professorship to teach at the National School of Anthropology and History in Mexico City. All Men Are Brothers was a Chinese tale written originally by Shi Nayan in the 14th century and a translation by American writer Pearl S. Book was illustrated by Covarubius for the Limited Edition Club in 1948. And in this volume he demonstrated a clear understanding of and empathy for Chinese drawing styles, both in terms of the description of the characters in physical terms and their technical execution. But it was his fascination with native cultures which had come to dominate and during the 1950s he published several books such as Pueblo del Sol by Alfonso Caso, a study of Aztec culture in 1953 and a year later he authored and illustrated another highly regarded book about Native American art titled The Eagle, the Jaguar and the Serpent. But despite the bulk of his output now being more academic, there were still examples of other work including 1953's book John and Juan in the Jungle, written by Ivan T. Sanderson. It contained a series of immaculate illustrations of birds and animals native to Latin America, most of which incorporated equally well observed jungle backgrounds. And although it was Covarubius' only real excursion into wildlife art as such, the book was very successful, not least because of his contribution. And a year later he completed a spectacularly colourful mosaic mural titled Genesis, The Gift of Life, on display outside the Dallas Museum of Art. In 1955 he married for the second time to a young dancer, Rocio Seguion, but unfortunately it seems he had never got round to divorcing his first wife, which led him into some unwelcome legal problems. Whether he managed to resolve this situation I don't know, but it ultimately didn't really matter, as Miguel Covarrubias died at the remarkably young age of only 53 in 1957, following surgery for an ulcer in Mexico City. Later that year his book Indian Art of Mexico and Central America was published posthumously and made a fitting end to his life and remarkable career. And I'd like to end this tribute with a compilation of a few more examples of his many illustrations which I couldn't make room for earlier 